I'm going to be talking about Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park, home of the code breakers. In 1940, 19 year old Mavis Lever left her German degree at UCL to go to Bletchley Park. She didn't quite know what she was going to be doing there. She didn't really know what Bletchley Park was, but she knew that she wanted to help with the war effort. In 1944, Valerie Glassborough went to Bletchley Park. Again, she didn't know quite what she was going to be doing there. She went with her sister. They left the Foreign Office in London and went to work at Bletchley Park. About 60 years later in 2003, I went to Bletchley Park for the first time. I wasn't there to help with the war effort. I was there for a meeting for the British Computer Society. After the meeting, I went for a walk around to have a look at the site. It's a 26 acre site north of London. I met some people, a guy called John Turner and his team, who were rebuilding the bomb machine. The bomb machine that was one of the main code breaking machines featured in the imitation game, the film that you might have seen, which was there to break Enigma. After talking to John for some time and marvelling at what they were doing in rebuilding this machine, he asked me why I was at the meeting. Why was I at Bletchley Park? I told him that I was there representing BCS Women, a group of women in computing that I'd set up a few years previously. And he said, women in computing? Did you know that more than half the people that worked at Bletchley Park were women? So I said, no. In my mind, I thought it was about 50 old blokes wearing tweed jackets and smoking pipes and doing the Times crossword. <laughs> I, I never even thought that it, there were any women there, let alone more than 50% women. So I said, how many people worked here during the war? He said, more than 10,000. So that blew my mind. I really thought it had been about 50 men. So the fact that more than 5,000 women had worked there during the war was incredible. I went away that day, got on the train and thought, I've got to do something about this. We're, everyone should know about the women that worked at Bletchley Park. So I spent some time trying to raise money to run a project which we eventually called the Women of Station X. Station X is another name for Bletchley Park. Eventually in 2008, I managed to raise some money and uh, we ran the project, interviewed some of the women that had worked at Bletchley Park. It was an oral history project. At the launch of that project, the CEO of Bletchley Park, Simon Greenish, said that Bletchley Park was teetering on a financial knife edge. Basically, if they didn't get some money in soon, they might have to close. I thought to myself, that's ridiculous. It's the home of the code breakers. 10,000 people worked there during World War II. I went away thinking, I need to do something about that. A couple of months later, I went to a reception at Bletchley Park and did a proper tour around the whole site. While I was there, I did a tour. We had a look around the whole site and then at the end of the tour, we were stood in front of Hut 6, a hut that was used where, where major code-breaking achievements happened during the war. And the guy who was giving the tour, who was a veteran, who'd worked there during the war, said, the work that was done here is said to have shortened the war by two years. And at that time, 11 million people a year were dying. So potentially the work done at Bletchley Park saved 22 million lives. So I stood there looking at this hut thinking, that's ridiculous. 10,000 people worked here, more than half of them women during the war. The work done here is said to have shortened the war by two years and 11 million people a year were dying, so saving 22 million lives, and it might have to close for lack of funds. I need to do something about this. So I went away that day, and I, at the time I was um, head of a computer science department at the University of Westminster. I emailed all the heads and professors in the UK and said, we need to help save Bletchley Park. There's a petition on the 10 Downing Street website uh, which is asking the government to help. Please sign it. And I sent the link. I had a look at that page um, a few hours later and saw that lots of the famous heads and professors from the UK had signed the petition. Now, I'd, I'd felt very scared sending that email because I was a new head of department and I was basically emailing all the people that I looked up to in the country whose textbooks I'd used as a student 
and I was quite frightened sending that email. So I was very glad when I saw that they'd actually signed the petition and I didn't get any angry emails saying, who do you think you are telling us to sign a petition? So I was relieved, but also it gave me confidence. And then I thought, what else can I do? What we did was a colleague and myself at work wrote a letter to the Times and asked all of the heads and professors to sign it, and they did. So within a few days, we got 97 heads and professors of computing from around the country to sign a letter uh, an open letter to go in the Times petitioning the government to help save Bletchley Park. That letter went in in July 2008. I also wanted to try and get more publicity, so I told all the journalists that I knew, which was about three, uh, <laughs> that I thought it was a good story. And luckily one of them, Rory Keflin jones from the BBC, phoned me up straight away and said, yes, I think it is a story. He invited me up to Bletchley Park, he interviewed me there, and... Um, got me on the news. So here I am on the BBC News. I had uh, friends in Australia and Canada Facebooking me saying, we've just seen you on the news, what's going on? <laughs> I had no idea that it would actually straight away go right across the world. So that was a real surprise for me. It was an amazing day. I also did my first live TV. And um, as I sat before I went into the uh, TV interview, I sat there thinking, I wish I could have a heart attack. I'm so scared. I'd actually rather go to hospital <laughs> <laughs> and die than, <laughs> than go and do this interview. A little bit like I felt before I came out here. <laughs> so, but luckily, I didn't have a heart attack. And another funny thing was that um, Fergal Sharkey from the Undertones was sitting opposite me, and he looked just as scared as I, as I did. So that gave me a bit of comfort. So I did lots of interviews that day. It went round the world on TV. It was amazing. I got about 200 emails. Um, I was a very happy person. We got lots of publicity. But then two, three, four days later, the next week, well, of course, if you get something in the traditional media, it's news one minute, and then the next day, it's all over, really. And so I was casting around for quite some time trying to work out how do we keep this story in the public consciousness. So it wasn't until Christmas that year I really started using Twitter I'd been to a conference where people were using it and, it and I suddenly realized that actually it was something that I could use for campaigning. We went away, my partner and I and my youngest daughter went away to a farm that Christmas and unfortunately I became obsessed with Twitter so I spent most of the time on my phone <laughs> while my boyfriend sat watching TV and my, my daughter, because she was about three, was asleep. Um, and uh, he, he didn't get too fed up with me, but it was a bit difficult. Um, so I just spent the whole time, really, in the evenings, especially on my phone tweeting, as you can see. Um, throughout that holiday, I really started to understand how you can use Twitter to connect to other people. I spent a lot of time, time trying to work out the culture and how it worked, what people were saying. Um, who was interested in what other people were saying. I just was looking through at what everyone was doing and thinking, how can I use this to help save Bletchley Park? I then, um, at the end of the holiday, or towards the end of the holiday, I'd, put, I'd set up a blog before that, and I put the blog, Saving Bletchley Park blog, link as my profile um, link on Twitter. And... What happened was, towards the end of the holiday, someone contacted me and said, I want to help you save Bletchley Park. So we arranged to meet up um, after I got back to London. So one of the people that had contacted me in the summer was Captain Jerry Roberts, an amazing guy who was one of the code breakers at Bletchley Park. Jerry Roberts was giving a talk at UCL in London just after Christmas. So I invited the guy Sizemore, his name is, to come along to the talk with me so that we could talk about Bletchley Park. So we went to Jerry's talk and he said lots of amazing things, including that he deciphered a message from Hitler. So we were like, how do you know it was from Hitler? And he said he got to the end and it, it said signed Hitler, Führer. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so he signed a message, uh, he deciphered a message straight from Hitler. So that just in itself was incredible, but he did loads of major code breaking uh, things at Bletchley Park. So we listened to Jerry's talk um, and Sizemore got very excited. The next day we went up to Bletchley Park together along with a guy called Documentally and uh, Jemima Knight. And we spent the whole day talking to the people at Bletchley Park about social media and what could be done with it. 
and also taking Sizemore and the guys around Bletchley Park for them to see what was actually there. They had an amazing day and Sizemore said, this place is the geek mecca. And I just thought, yeah, that's actually, that's absolutely it, it's the geek mecca. So also documentally who came along as an amazing guy, well, they're both amazing guys. He got Bletchley Park set up on Twitter, showed them how to use it and gave them a Twitter masterclass. And everyone was also tweeting and videoing everything we were doing. And uh, just really, that really kick-started basically a Twitter uh, campaign, which was incredible. So that was great. Again, this massive peak of interest on Twitter, then what to do next? So I was sitting after a couple of beers one night at my computer at home. And I saw this tweet and this photo. Stephen Fry was stuck in a lift. And um, he couldn't get out. So apparently they tried the bell, they'd phoned people, they were just stuck in the lift. So they tweeted a photograph of themselves, which I thought was really funny. So I saw that photo and I thought, Stephen Fry, he must be interested in Bletchley Park. So I checked on Twitter and he was following me, which was great. So I sent him several direct messages and said, please, please help. You know, you can really help us save Bletchley Park. And then after another bottle of beer, I went to bed and thought, oh, well, I gave it a go. I got up the next morning. I was at my computer again. and I got a message from Stephen Fry. I've tweeted. Hope it helps. So Stephen Fry tweeted a link to my blog. And I'd been getting about 50 hits a day on my blog, which I thought was great. <laughs> <laughs> after, tweeting Stephen, after Stephen Fry tweeting uh, a link to my blog, I got 8,000 hits that day. So it just showed me, really, if you find the right people to help you, what a difference that can make. And that day, I was the most retweeted person on Twitter in the world. Wow. <laughs> well, that will never happen again. Because <laughs> that was 2009, uh, and how things have changed since then. So, social media played an absolutely massive role in helping to save Bletchley Park. I spent a lot of time, along with lots of other people, trying to really build up this massive community of people I spent time searching for Bletchley Park or people were tweeting about Bletchley Park. Um, I talked to everyone I met about Bletchley Park. I gave talks about Bletchley Park and lots of other people did too. It wasn't just me. There were hundreds of people doing this. And gradually the community got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the amount of people who knew what we were doing got bigger too. And that was really thanks to Twitter um, in the main that that happened. Then um, various achievements happened through sort of 2010, 2011, where social media played a big part. One thing that you can do with Twitter is reach lots of people really quickly. And so when things came up, like there was a Building for Pride, Wix ran a Building for Pride uh, competition where they needed people to vote online. And so, of course, because we had this massive uh, community of people that cared about Bletchley Park, as soon as we put the word out, then everyone was retweeting it and we got to thousands, I don't know, hundreds of thousands probably of people who then voted and Bletchley Park won the Building with Pride Award. And that happened in, in several other ways too. So with other things like um, I, I would uh, find people on Twitter who I thought would be interested and I would uh, chat to them because again, about five years ago, even really well-known people starting to use Twitter were quite keen to chat to anybody really like me, anyone like me. <laughs> and so they did, whereas I think that's a lot harder uh, these days. So I would find people, say to them, blah, 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 Bletchley Park, you know, it's really important, 22 million lives saved, uh, how can you help? And so one guy who was uh, the universities and science minister said, come and talk to me. I talked to him and he said, when I said, how can you help? He said, I can set up an EDM. So I said, that's great. What's an EDM? <laughs> <laughs> so he told me it was an early day motion, which basically is a way of uh, creating awareness within Parliament about specific issues. And so he did that. That's just one example. Lots of people did lots of things to try and raise awareness. And Twitter really was at the heart of all of that. So at one meeting, um, a Google vice president was speaking. And I thought... Google, they've got money. <laughs> Maybe they can help Bletchley Park. She seemed really nice, so I talked to her at the end of the meeting and told her about Bletchley Park. And in a nutshell, what happens, happened was that then uh, Google started a relationship with Bletchley Park where we went up there and talked 
and the first thing uh, that we really did was to have a massive garden party in the grounds of Bletchley Park, which was amazing. Here are some of the photos here uh, from the day. And I was in charge of inviting people to the garden party. So I invited a thousand of my closest friends. <laughs> but basically all the people that I could think of that had been involved with the campaign over the years and invited them to the garden party. It was an amazing day in August, I think in 2011. And it was the only day, I think, in August where it absolutely tipped it down all day <laughs> until just when the party finished and then the sun came out. So... It wasn't a great day, but 400 people came out to Bletchley Park uh, for that party, and it was really, really incredible. Just after that party, I was in a meeting with Simon Greenish, the CEO, and a representative from Google, and I was saying something about saving Bletchley Park. And Simon said to me, hang on, Sue, you don't need to say saving Bletchley Park anymore. Bletchley Park is saved. You now need to talk about building Bletchley Park. So in 2011... Finally, Bletchley Park was saved. That didn't mean it was out of the water. Uh, Bletchley Park had got some money from English Heritage, which had helped them, and then a major amount of money, 4.6 million from Heritage Lottery Fund, which helped too. And uh, now it's been renovated, as you may have seen. So what happened to Mavis and Valerie? Well, 19-year-old Mavis, who went to Bletchley Park, ended up making one of the major code-breaking achievements of the Second World War. And she also met her husband, Keith, who was a code breaker there too. And here they are a few years ago. They were happily married for 68 years uh, until Mavis died, I think, last year or the year before. And Valerie, what happened to Valerie? Well, Valerie's granddaughter went up to Bletchley Park last year. She did a tour. She got to talk to some of the people that had actually worked there with her grandmother. And she had a go on an Enigma machine. You may recognise... Valerie's granddaughter. Thank you very much.